Hey guys, welcome back to Home Built, and in this episode, I'm going to continue sorting through this mess of wires on the Ferrari engine. Welcome back guys, and those watching last week will have seen that I started rewiring the Ferrari engine to the Link ECU that I'm going to have running it. As I mentioned last week, the original uh, Ferrari ECUs, which I have, they're very primitive and they have a immobilizer which is going to be difficult to get around and I have to change things. There's too many things to actually get the factory ECUs to run and they're quite old anyway. They're not a great design. They basically run this car as two four cylinders. So there's two looms, two ECUs that sort of piggyback off each other. It's a bit of an old system that's not that great and uh, the link is going to be a much better option. Uh, and like I mentioned last week, the engine is actually simpler than you would actually uh, be led to believe. As I said, uh, at least for wiring and basic sort of components, it's much simpler than the Audi engine that uh, I wired into my uh, Rockstar. If you missed it, I'll put a link up above so you can catch up and uh, think about subscribing. It does help us out. This week I thought I'd get a little bit more in detail on how to uh, wire up some of the components and, uh, and, and sort of a, a basic rundown on wiring up the uh, ECU. So uh, first of all, let's uh, get this plenum back off again so I can sort of get in and see what I'm doing and get stuck back in. Right, so I thought I'd just quickly go over the main sensors that are on this engine and are on most engines to uh, make things a little bit clearer. So you can see these things down here. There's one there, there's one there, and there's another two further back. They are knock sensors, and uh, all the knock sensors I've seen generally look pretty much the same as that, a little sort of donut thing that are bolted onto the block somewhere. Uh, on, in this case, the link can only run two knock sensors. So I'm gonna run um, the forwardmost knock sensor on this side and the rearmost knock sensor on that side to get a cross section of what's happening on the engine. Um, you've got other sensors around the place that are like this. So this is, the, uh, this is the engine coolant temperature because you can see here, you can work them out because this is connected to the, uh, the coolant lines in the, the uh, engine. So that is obviously a temperature sensor for the coolant. So uh, there's a two wire sensor for that. And then you've got uh, coming over here, this is actually where the cam angle sensors are on this engine. So they actually go into the top of the cams on either side of the engine. And, uh, and also at the front here, you've got the crank angle sensor that I put onto this engine. So uh, basically all this does is with this, uh, this toothed wheel that I've got on the engine, there's a gap in the teeth here. So as it rotates, it goes past this magnet. The magnet senses every time there is a tooth and every time there is a gap and it counts them. And when it gets to the, the bit with the teeth missing, they go, oh, that's the start of the sequence. And uh, it doesn't actually have to line up with top dead center. It just sort of knows, okay, well, that's where the tooth is missing and it's 27 degrees from that or whatever. And that's how they work. Now, I quickly mentioned that there are two different types of sensors that can be used on crank and cam angle sensors. There are Hall effect sensors and inductive sensors. And generally, there's pros and cons to both, and I won't go into that, but basically, um, to tell the difference, generally a Hall effect sensor has three wires and an inductive sensor has two wires. So um, it's just something to know when you go to wire them up. Another thing that, uh, that I missed, and um, one of my uh, viewers, eagle-eyed viewers, Eric, picked up. Thank you very much um, for your uh, uh, reaching out. These, coil packs. Um, not all coil packs are built the same, and um, 
particularly on some of these older engines, some of them don't have internal igniters. So um, basically they need an external igniter unit to run them. I falsely assumed that because this had three wires, this had internal igniters, but that is not actually the case. And uh, after looking at it a little bit more, uh, basically if you, if you test the resistance between the, um, the, the power wire in and the, uh, and the trigger wire, um, if there is um, about a one ohm resistance, which these have, it means that they do not have igniters. So these are not gonna cut the mustard. There are a couple of ways I can go, but I am actually, I actually tested out a GDR or a 370Z coil, which I've got in Harry uh, in here, and they're actually a nice fit. So I might actually just swap them over to GDR coils. Um, I think they'll do the uh, do a job nicely, give it a nice strong spark, probably more than what these gave in the first place, which is not a bad thing. Um, so moving on, um, I think we still need to keep trudging away, getting this wiring done. Um, we're getting there. We are getting there. Now I'm having a look at the variable valve timing. Now I mentioned it earlier, but this is a very crude form of variable valve timing on this car. Uh, basically, each there's, there's a solenoid on either side that, uh, that as I mentioned earlier, sort of um, changes the, the tension on the cam chain, which will alter the timing of the engine. It's just an on or off thing. It's not like a, it's not a smooth transition. It's just a really simple thing as far as I can understand. They're very simple solenoids. Uh, originally they were basically connected straight to the body ground of the, uh, you know, just the ground of the car. And, uh, and then obviously a 12 volt signal would come from the ECU to turn them on or not. And, um, with the link, most of the auxiliary outputs need to be um, ground switched. So all I'm doing with these now is I'm gonna rewire them. Uh, they actually link together. The, the, the wires come and, and loop, group together. So they're going to only to one auxiliary output. And basically I'll change over the wiring. So instead of wiring to ground, I'll wire them straight to 12 volts and the auxiliary output of the ECU will just go to ground. So that's another thing I can tick off the list. All right, that was a lot of work, lots of days, sitting here, uh, working through wires, working out what sensor's gonna go where, what I need to replace, what I don't, what I'm, uh, what's going to work, what's not gonna work. And I now have all of my wiring for the engine done. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> um, there are a few wires that are left over from the original Ferrari loom, which I'll, now I need to go through and try and remove them if I can. Um, and uh, there are things like, uh, this had two airflow meters, it now doesn't. Um, there's, uh, it had four knock sensors, now only has two. There's, there's, so there's a few bits and pieces that are, have changed or uh, are wired in different places than they were before, so they're no longer necessary. But I've definitely got enough to get this car running now. I have uh, filled up my, my sheet with all the locations of all the different sensors that are uh, on this car. And this 47 pin plug, I have two spots left. And, um, and I've also filled up this other one, which is a eight pin plug. So there's a lot of wires. Um, it makes this car extra complicated with a couple of things. Um, I had to actually run these, uh, one of these link. This is an e-throttle module. So uh, basically this is so that I can run the two throttle bodies. Cause a lot of aftermarket ECUs can't necessarily run two separate throttle bodies. You need to have a, an ECU capable of that. And the link is. Um, so I've wired that up now and um, I am quite happy with this. So uh, now I'm gonna go through and uh, see if we can just strip out the unused wires and then we can get onto another thing that I need to still um, physically do to the engine. Um, a couple of little things that I am changing on this is uh, on the back here, I'll bring you around. All right, so around the back here, this is uh, what I originally thought was an oil pressure sensor that was on the back of the Ferrari engine. But um, this is actually only an oil pressure sender. So basically this just goes to a gauge. So um, I uh, 
went on to Raceworks and I got, I got myself an adapter um, that uh, that screws into the back here. And then I got a oil pressure sensor that can screw right in. Now, this may end up being a little bit too long. So I might actually adapt it around to a hose and sit it in through here. And it's probably better if it's on a hose and, uh, and just mounted in on the wiring harness itself so that it's not vibrating as much with the engine. It'll be sort of insulated by the wires. Uh, I think there'll be a better way to do it. So I've got the uh, pressure sensor here. It's already uh, been wired into the loom. I've already got uh, the wiring set up for it. I've also wired up the fan and the electric water pumps in the front. So that's all uh, sorted out as well. As I mentioned before, both throttle bodies, everything is sorted. Yes! Alrighty, well we have now a completely wrapped up wiring loom. This is all complete and uh, terminated. I will have to change over the coil pack fittings. Um, Raceworks has actually been quick. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, these ones won't, uh, won't cut the mustard, these Ferrari ones, because they don't have internal igniters. Um, Raceworks have already got me out these uh, fantastic, these are 350Z or 370Z uh, coil packs. They're these and the R35 GDRs are the same, but the length of the stalk is different. So uh, the top is exactly the same. So these ones are a better length to fit perfectly into the, uh, the Ferrari engine. So that is uh, great. But uh, besides that, this is all good and done. So the, um, the next thing I need to have a look at on this car is how we're gonna monitor the air that's coming into the engine. So. On uh, a factory car, originally, uh, when they first went over to computers, they, uh, or crude computers, they had airflow meters, which was basically in the inlet, there was a flap, and as the air gets sucked into the engine, it opens and closes the flap, and the further it opens, the more air that's obviously going in, so it tells the computer by uh, how much air is going in from that flap. They then moved on to, uh, mass airflow sensors. So this is uh, what the Ferrari had originally. This is uh, basically what's inside of these things is a, uh, a heated wire. Uh, the, basically it heats the wire up, the computer heats the wire up, and as the air flows past, it cools the wire down. So as it cools it down, it, uh, it measures how the, uh, the temperature of the wire basically, and that tells the computer how much air is going in the engine, so then it can give fuel to uh, match the amount of air that goes into, um, into the engine. It is a restriction in the airflow. Um, there, there, there are quite a few downsides to this. It's also very difficult to, uh, for, to, to modify this, uh, this signal and, and sort of tune with this. So, um, what most people, when they go to uh, an aftermarket system do, and what I am doing today, is we're going over to something that's very simple, and it's just this little thing here. So basically, all you really need um, now is, is one of these, which is a map sensor. So this is a um, manifold absolute pressure sensor. So it, as it says, measures the pressure of air that's in the, uh, the system. You can just run it off of a, uh, a vacuum line, uh, from the plenum of the car, so it has to be behind the throttle body, obviously. And uh, this particular one is uh, even more clever because this is a T-map, so this has a uh, intake air temperature sensor as well. You uh, Basically, you need a temperature sensor to tell how warm the air is because obviously if the air is warmer, it's thinner, so it needs more fuel. If it's cooler, it's denser, um, and uh, it, the computer needs to be able to uh, vary for that. So my next task is to make a mount and uh, work out how I'm going to fit this. So to mount the sensor, um, Raceworks actually do a mount as well, which is, which is perfect. So this is a weld on aluminium mount that uh, I'm going to mount onto the side of one of the intakes. Now it's only going to give me the signal from one side, not both. They are joined. Um, there's just no easy way to get a, a signal from both and uh, it will be even enough for my situation. So um, 
I'm going to mount it on the side here of this intake. It's gonna be a little bit challenging because this mount is flat, this piece is curved. I'm gonna put it on the flattest part so that the, uh, basically, the signal, the wiring is gonna be going down, sort of hidden as much underneath on sort of uh, the plenum as possible and uh, do the job. So let's start uh, finding a spot, drilling, welding, do my thing. All right, and uh, we are all mounted. It's not the prettiest, but that's the same of most of my welding, but uh, it's on there. It's uh, got no holes in it. It's gonna do the job nicely. So let's put this manifold back on the engine and see uh, how it all looks. Okay, so we have the T-Map mounted on now. Um, all nicely, that's a perfect spot for the wiring to run down nicely and just uh, tuck in underneath the uh, manifold, which is where all of the wiring is gonna run and it's gonna sit nicely on the car. So. That is a fantastic step in the right direction. And it also means that um, I think I've done for this week. We are, we are chipping away at these jobs. I am very happy with how this has all come out. I'm really getting my head around how ECUs work now, particularly uh, how the, uh, the Link ECU works and how to integrate these things. And it's not that huge mystery. Hopefully some of you that uh, maybe haven't played with these things or look at it, that it's a uh, uh, black magic. It's actually, uh, it's actually not super complicated. It's, it's breaking it down one thing at a time. But anyway, that is all the time I have this week. Before Mrs. Jeff, uh, I think we have another episode of Mail Time. All right, guys, and yes, we have another episode of Mail Time this week. And uh, this week we've got a letter from Italy, from uh, Marco. All right, so it's, a, it's quite a detailed uh, long letter, but I'll paraphrase it. Basically, Marco Pebellini is 26 years old from Bovolone, a small town near Verona in Italy. He's been passionate about uh, historical cars since he was a child, and uh, he was initially uh, dubious about my project with the Al Ferrari because uh, the original engine is, uh, in his words, sacré. Um, but he's come around to it, which is which is great to hear. Thank you, Marco. Um, and uh, he's also it's given him the motivation to start work on his own project car, uh, which is a 1992 Fiat Panda. Uh, and he's putting a Fiat uh, 1.4 T-Jet engine into it. So um, good luck with that, Marco. Uh, it sounds like a great project. And um, he's actually part of the Fiat Panda Club Italia. And he has sent in with his letter a sticker for the wall of the uh, Italian Fiat Panda Club. So um, thank you very much, Marco. Thank you for your kind words. Uh, glad you are enjoying the uh, trials and tribulations of this uh, crazy build. And uh, I'm going to stick your sticker up on the wall. Okay, so the sticker's now up on the wall, and if you guys want to send anything through to uh, to me here at Home Built by Jeff to go on the wall or whatever, uh, send it through to Home Built by Jeff, PO Box 1520, Barrel, New South Wales 2576, Australia. Hi guys. 1961 was an extremely tumultuous year for Ferrari. After the death of his young son, Dino, a few years earlier, Enzo Ferrari started spending more and more time locked away in his office. His wife, Laura, began overseeing more and more of the day-to-day -day going on at Maranello, and this was not taken kindly by many of his employees. This all came to a head when sales manager, Girolamo Gardini, who had complained many times to Enzo about his wife's involvement, 
finally issued an ultimatum. Me or your wife. Enzo Ferrari, of course, was not one to be ever told what to do and promptly fired Gardini. Rather than this being the end of it, development chief Giotto Bizzarini, uh, chief engineer Carlo Chitti, and Scuderia manager Romolo Tavoni signed a complaint letter along with five others complaining about Lara's involvement and the firing of Gardini. It is unclear what happened next once Enzo Ferrari got the letter, but the men promptly left Ferrari. It's not sure whether they were fired or they resigned, but they left leaving half done projects and a really big hole in what was quite a small company at the time. They went on to start their own company and Formula One team with the backing of the wealthy Venetian Count Giovanni Volpi. Ferrari managed to claw their way back, of course, but the 60s was not an easy decade for Ferrari. All right, well, that is uh, all the wiring on the engine done. Uh, basically, it's, it's almost all the wiring done in the car. Uh, there is going to be a bit more when I actually put the body loom back in. I've got to terminate all those ends and stuff like that. But that's way down the line. Mm -hmm. uh, that's when the car is getting its final assembly. And uh, it's probably not as far down the line as... Um, yeah, yeah, I was thinking that. These things do come around. Like, you never thought you were going to get through the wiring and here, look at you. Yeah. Loving every moment of it. Yeah. Actually, it's been quite, uh, as I mentioned last week, it was quite cathartic. It's, it's, and now I'm getting my head around how this stuff actually works. It's, it's all making sense and it's not as complicated as I thought. I know I keep saying this, but it really isn't. Once you start chipping away at it, it, it all sort of becomes clear. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Anyway. One step at a time. Yes, we're getting there. We are getting there. We are. Please like and subscribe if you haven't already, if you want to follow Jeff on now. Patreon, see the videos a day early without any ads. Yep. And um, let him know what you think of everything. He likes to read your comments. And, yes. And um, join him on his crazy car field journey. Yes. Of mechanical delight. <laughs> <laughs> Have a good one, guys. We'll see you next Bye, time. Guys. See ya. <clears throat> Today, ongoings at Maranello, and this was not taken kindly. His wife Lara began overseeing more of the day-to-day -day on oh, going going ons. Don't they goings on? Girolamo Gardini made another. He offered Enzo a ultimatum: Lara or me. Shall I do that again? Yes. <laughs> <laughs>